good evening class good evening class and welcome to the gospel and acts gsa a new subject that we're starting now which kicks off our survey of the new testament text now just to start off just to refresh our memory you will remember when we started the survey in the old testament we discussed the bible and you just need to be aware of this and these facts that we're going to be giving now if you had to meet somebody in the street and you had to explain to that person what is the new testament what would your explanation be thinking of it in terms of the composition of the new testament what would how would you describe the new testament okay so let me just recap this for you the bible consists of the old testament and the new testament divided in 39 books in the old testament 27 books in the new testament a total of 66 books uh, divided into verses and chapters now we're starting a study of the gospels and acts but let's have a look at the bible in general when we look at four biographies what are we referring to do you know okay so we've got four biographies what is a biography of someone's life okay we'll we'll get back to that now then one historical book what what is that then we've got 13 pauline epistles could be a slight debate about 14 or 13 but let's keep to 13 as most biblical scholars agree on that what are we referring to general epistles So basically the other books of the Bible and then one prophetical book. Okay, so when we talk about the biographies, we're looking at Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. The historical book is Acts of the Apostles. And then interesting just note this that the Pauline epistles are further divided into what is known as the prison epistles these are the letters that paul wrote whilst incarcerated or in prison philemon philippians ephesians colossians and then also you get what is referred to as the pastoral epistles 1 timothy 2 timothy and titus what is the significance of knowing that Why would it be important to know that this is a pastoral epistle? When you're reading the book of say Timothy, why is it significant to know that that is a pastoral epistle? Suppose it's more about Luke's side, suppose that he was mentally Timothy actually, the information that he get out of it is more mental mental based as as a part. Okay. Yeah, so very significant for leadership. And when you read the book, you look at the book in the situational context. In other words, what occasioned the book to be written, and you also consider the original audience to who was the book written. Because it was written to them, but the Holy Spirit wrote it for us. It sounds the same, but it's not the same. because when you read in the book of corinthians which is a pauline epistle that paul instructs the women of the church to do certain things it was written to the women in the church of corinth the years or the year that the book was written it might have an application for today but it wasn't written for today the interpretation of the book cannot be applied to every situation So you can't look at the book and say, you know, I have to cover my head now because it says this in Corinthians. That was an instruction for the church back then in their situational context and in their culture, in their historical setting. It was written for them. So when you do 
hermeneutics and you learn how to do proper exegesis, the, the application of the hermeneutical principles, you will consider what book you are in. Who was it written to? Why was it written? And what was the culture of the day? You will consider that. You will also look at the verse, you will look at the chapter, and you will look at the entire book and the type of literature. Because obviously when you're reading an epistle written to a church and you're reading an historical narrative, there's a difference in the way you read those books. And there's a difference in interpretation a lot of times as far as that is concerned. Then, when we look at the general epistles, it's just handy for us to know that that refers to Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Jude. And then the prophetical book is Revelation. Now, tonight we're starting our conversation about the introduction to the Gospels. And 1.1 in your manual says that the Gospels are the best books in the Bible. Now, I, mean, I know for us, as the Holy Spirit leads us in Bible study, any book we read becomes the best book. I mean, have you ever done Bible study early in the morning or at night, and you're busy and the Lord shows you something and you're so excited, that portion of Scripture just becomes so alive, so exciting. But then tomorrow the Lord shows you something different and you're in a different book. So we're not talking about the impartation and the revelation and the joy of enjoying the scripture. When we say they're the best books, we have a purpose in that statement because we have to understand that they talk about who? Jesus. Okay, so we will get into that a bit more. So the objective for tonight is to introduce the New Testament and explain why the Gospels are the central purpose of Scripture. If you didn't have the Gospels, just think of it. If you were reading your Bible and there were no Gospels, it would change your total theology, it will change your total outlook on Christianity. It's like our sister said tonight, you're reading the Old Testament text. You're seeing how God gets angry and disappointed and how God decides to destroy the earth with a flood. We see how fire rains down on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we look at God and we think God is angry. And it's scary. But if we look at it in terms of covenants, and we should know by now what that means, we see that God hasn't changed, but the covenant has changed. And the covenant has now positioned us in Christ, which means that the scales of justice have been satisfied and the wrath of God is satisfied. And when God looks at the earth, He sees Christ's blood which is the redemption sacrifice. So atonement has been given by innocent blood, and what the Lord sees is not humanity in its depravity and in its evil and the escalation of vulgarity and evil. He sees Christ. And this is the dispensation of grace, that the, the door of grace is open now. If God had to see the earth, in its current condition, a holy God would not have an option but to destroy the earth because of what's going on on the planet today. That is why people can get away with all sorts of things today because of grace. And this for us becomes alive as we study the Gospels. We can actually see that. Now, what we've also said tonight is we're looking at the biographies of Jesus and it's information on the most important life ever lived. There's no other life on planet Earth that was more important, more significant, that altered the course of humanity in that way. And we've got 
the different Gospels. We've got Matthew, we've got Mark, and we've got Luke. And if you remember, we said these were synoptic Gospels. Why? Because the content is synonymous, and therefore they're called synoptic Gospels. And then we've got the Maverick Gospel, which is which one? John. Why? Because 90% of the content in the book of John is not found in Matthew, in Mark, and in Luke. The priority of the Gospels, who knows what the priority of the Gospels are? Priority one, Jesus came. It tells us about the coming of the Messiah. And then, Jesus came to save. Now, there's a lot that we can say. And then there's also a bit of conjecture or theories. But let's mention this. There's a scholarly theory that says Mark was written first. And Mark was written based on Peter's eyewitness testimony. Again, th this is not 100% confirmed, but a lot of scholars believe that. And then also that Matthew and Luke then used Mark's gospel as a foundation for their own writings. Not because they wanted to copy Mark's gospel, but because what you will find when you read uh, various accounts in the different gospels, you will see different viewpoints, different perspectives, and different emphasis. And when you read all the gospels, Especially reading, say, the synoptic Gospels together, you see this whole picture unfold of a specific event. A lot of times when I feel that the Holy Spirit is impressing upon my heart to preach about a Gospel story, something that happened in the Gospel, I go to all accounts of that story found in the different Gospels, and I read all of them, and I study all of them, and you'd be surprised how the picture becomes clearer as you study the entire event and some of the blanks are filled in and this is what these authors under guidance of the Holy Spirit did. They filled in those blanks. So the intentions were to actually broaden the perspective of the life of Jesus. John, on the other hand, decided under the guidance of the Holy Spirit to present a totally different perspective. And you will see that as we study the book of John later, that there are things written, 90% of things written in John you won't find in the other Gospels. But those are critical teachings, especially that last night that Jesus spent with his disciples as he was giving them teachings on the abiding in the vine. He washed their feet. He taught them about the Holy Spirit. He taught them about prayer. You know, all of those aspects, a communion from there, all of that we, we find basically very elevated in the book of John. And we uh, learn a lot when we study that. Another interesting fact is that these Gospels, when they were written originally, they were also intended for different audiences. You will find that, and we can't get into that so much, but you will find that Matthew speaks to the Jews. And you will find that is why Matthew is the gospel that will take the Old Testament prophecies and mention them more than any of the other books. Because that, that was the language that the Jews understood. You will also find in the book of Matthew that Matthew refrains from using the kingdom of God. Because the Jews had a huge issue with saying the name of God. That is why Matthew talks about the kingdom of heaven. Because he didn't want to use the word God so much. Because kingdom is mentioned a lot in the, in the Gospels. And he didn't want to mention that so frequently because it would have offended a Jewish audience. That's just interesting. Who knows what, who Mark was written for? Mark was written for Romans. The Romans. And you know the Roman Empire was the governing empire. And there's a lot of clues in the book of Mark that indicates that it was written for the Romans. Luke 
spoke to the Greeks, and then John wrote to everyone. Now for many, many years, when we consider the Gospels, the coming of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ, we find that our, our dates, our calendars, have been set according to Jesus coming to earth. When we look at the timeline, the historical timeline, we'll see for many years they were talking about B.C., and A.D. as things were dated. B.C. stands for before Christ and A.D. Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. And then later on, the circular term evolved. But that was only later. As this battle between religion and science occurred in the Middle Ages, a lot of these things were changed and altered because the scientific community and the academic communities wanted to move away from their Christian roots because there was a fight, a battle between church and state for the control of the countries. That made them actually come up with various things to try and move away because every time you would say BC in a classroom you would admit that Jesus came and they wanted to take that out so they came up with BCE before the common era and CE common era so they tried to change that now if you go and study it you will see that all the greatest universities of the world were founded by the church. You can go to Yale, you can go to Harvard, you can go to Oxford, you can go to Cambridge, and if you study their histories, you will see that it was not the academics that found universities. Education started under Christian auspice. But when the division came between church and state, and there was a rivalry for political power, the circular terms started evolving. And that is also where all sorts of criticism came in of the Bible and all sorts of attacks came towards the Bible. But still, if we look at the date line, we still know, because even if you say before common era, you are still saying BC. Because as you can see, the date line starting at zero still starts at the birth of Jesus Christ, the coming of the Messiah. Now you will remember from our previous discussion that we spoke about Luke 24, 25 to 27. In this text, we see that Jesus, after his resurrection, he has a conversation with his disciples. And he says to them, How foolish are you and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Because they were confused about what happened. They thought, or many of them thought, that Jesus was going to come and he was going to restore the Jewish empire. They didn't understand that the kingdom that Messiah was going to establish, a kingdom that would be established for eternity, was not a physical kingdom, but it was a spiritual kingdom. So they didn't understand that. They thought it would be a physical kingdom like David had, like Solomon had, a united Israel had. They thought that was what was going to happen. And yet, the very oppressors of the Jewish people, the Romans, with the Jewish son Yedrin, crucifies Jesus. And they thought, what's just happened here? We were so excited that a week ago they were singing Hosanna to the king or Hosanna to the son of David as we were entering into Jerusalem and here they're screaming, crucify him. So for them, the reason they were scattered was it was a shock. They didn't expect it. Although when you study the Gospels, you will see that Jesus frequently, when he started his public ministry, he frequently warned them. He said to them, the Messiah has to suffer. The Son of Man 
has to suffer. He has to be handed over. He has to be crucified. He warned them, but this was kept from them, so they couldn't see it. So here, after they scattered and they ran away, Jesus speaks to them. He says to them, listen, how foolish are you guys? Are you slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken? Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter His glory? You see, the glory of the kingdom of God that came when Jesus died on the cross was not a visible glory. The temple veil tore open and Jesus said it was done. And on the day of Pentecost, the church received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They started moving in the power of the Spirit. They started ministering in the power of the Spirit. But this was not a restoration of a, of a physical kingdom. This was a kingdom that was forcefully advancing and the forceful had to take hold of this kingdom. This was a kingdom of light against darkness. This is a kingdom of ambassadors just passing through that pushes back darkness at every form of life as we as the kingdom of God engage the darkness. So the glory that we have is not necessarily the glory of this world where you're sitting on a big throne and everybody comes to you and bows before you and kisses your ring and that sort of thing. That's not the glory that we're talking about. The authority that we have is unseen authority. It's authority in the spirit. And it's kind of like the prophet said, open the eyes of my servant so that he can see. And when the Lord opened the servant's eyes, he looked into the spiritual. So that is the glory. When Jesus died on the cross, fulfilling the old covenant, Jesus himself said before that, he said, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. So he says something is shifting in the spirit. There's a climate change in the spirit. And now those who are in the kingdom have weapons of warfare which are not carnal. They're not physical, but they are spiritual. A big portion of understanding the Gospels and looking at the life Jesus lived is actually to see this pattern that Jesus shows us. When he talks about glory, he was born in a manger. He was beaten. He was crucified. There were many times when he was attacked by the religious leaders. Once they tried to throw him off a cliff. Other times they wanted to stone him. What glory is he speaking about? He's not talking about physical glory necessarily, but he's talking about a spiritual position that you and I have today even as we stand in the kingdom of God. So he says, listen guys, this had to happen. I mean, we understand that now looking at the Levitical order of the lamb being sacrificed under the law and that lamb having to be sacrificed every single year. We understand that when Jesus Christ came to earth, the Son of Man, He lived this sinless life under the law. And then He went to the cross willingly. When the Passover lambs were slaughtered, at the same time Jesus Christ was slaughtered on the cross as the eternal sacrifice. And the prophets spoke about this, but they couldn't see it. They didn't understand that a human being could be that Lamb of God. Although John said it, He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He knew He was the Lamb of God, but they didn't see it. So they were slow. And He says yeah, He says, Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter His glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scripture concerning himself. He opened their eyes to the entire Bible by saying to them, listen, when you look to the Bible, look for me. And there in the beginning, the word was in the beginning. And there in the fire, with the Hebrews when they were thrown in the fire. I'm there in the tabernacle. I'm there above the tabernacle. 
You will see Jesus in all the scriptures. And you will see the, the redemption pattern set out as types. And here you see the fulfillment. And when they understood that finally, the revelation came to them. And that meant that all of a sudden, the entire Bible started making sense. Isn't that what Bible school is all about? It's about walking out of the class or out of the classes into this world. And the Bible all of a sudden becomes alive to the point where a transformation takes place in you. And you start handling things around you in a different way because of the internal revelation that you've received. Not just sitting and saying, oh, you know, I can't stand reading this Exodus and oh, I'm battling to read this Numbers and oh, you know, now I have to read my Bible again. Oh, it's so boring and it's so difficult and all of that. No, the Bible becomes alive because you're seeing Jesus in the Bible from cover to cover. And all of a sudden, you understand that it's not just about Jesus, it's about you too. Because now he says, listen, I am the light of the world, now you the light of the world. And we will see that as we go through the Gospels. He says, I came into the world as a light, now you the light of the world. And then he says, greater works will you do because I go unto my Father. So all of a sudden there's this pattern that we see in Jesus, looking unto Jesus Christ, the author and the perfecter of our faith. He's the author, he starts it, and he's the perfecter. He takes us step by step as we start acquiring by faith what is provided by grace, and we start stepping into kingdom dynamics, and we can only go as far as our faith will allow us. As soon as we say we can't believe it, we get to a point where we say we can't receive it. When we look at the Gospels, in fact for me it's always been like that. When I read the Gospels, my faith is stirred up. One day I was counting the miracles in the Gospels and I think I counted to about 48 miracles in the Gospels that were recorded. John that tells us that if everything had to be written down that Jesus did, not even all the books in the world would be enough to record that. So we've got a snapshot from four different viewpoints giving us this picture of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, coming to earth, the greatest event to occur ever in human history. And then as we're looking at these viewpoints, and we start realizing that the entire Bible is about Jesus. We start seeing him from cover to cover. And then we start receiving the revelation. Then we go to what he did. His works. And then we go to his words. What he said. And then from that we start coloring in the picture. So that we can have proper understanding of what our Christian life is all about. I think it was in Christian Basics 1 where we were talking about the Trinity once and it says that God the Father was revealed progressively to humanity. You will find in your notes it talks about an ant it says, you know, you've got this ant on your table and uh, you've got problems with this ant, but you, want, you don't want to kill the ant, you don't want to get rid of the ant, but you want the ant to actually go and eat there. You've got some food, you want to put it down there. You don't want the ant here. So you have to try and move the ants. But because you're not an ant, you can't communicate with the ants. So the ants can't understand. When God was uh, coming down on the mountain in fire, I mean, Israel just ran away. They didn't want to see God. I mean, the fear of God was literally in them. They were so scared. 
So God had to find a way of also revealing himself to us. And in his infinite wisdom, he sent Christ, who then became an ant, to come and talk to the ants and come and show the ant. That means that when we look at the Son of God, Jesus Christ, in John 1.18 we read, No one has ever seen God, but the one and the only Son who is himself God and is in, close, in the closest relationship with the Father has made him known. You can go and study this. Jesus, the Bible says, was the radiant image of the Father. He came to make the Father known. And He came to show us God as Father. The Jewish nation who had a relationship with God never had the relationship of Father. You will find the term of Father comes alive in the New Testament. As Jesus comes and He introduces the Father to us. He says, this is your Father. In fact, for many of the Jews, that was quite offensive. Calling God your Father. But we now understand that God has always been our Father. But because of sin... And because of the condition of humanity, it was not possible for us to have that father-son relationship. But now because of the blood of Christ, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we can now have that father-son relationship. The total revelation of God. If you look at what Moses knew of God, and if you look at what David knew of God, and if you look at what maybe Solomon knew of God, you will see fragmented pieces of God. But Jesus comes and He demonstrates God. Not just God in the sense of God far off, away, but He comes and He demonstrates God as an intimate Father. And then also that we are now capable of having this relationship with God. If you read the book of John, Specifically, in the Gospel of John, you will read that he says, you must ask the Father in my name. That was never revealed to humanity before then. That we could go to the Father. And because of what Jesus did and Jesus' position, we have legal right to address God as our Father. I mean, and that revelation grows as you are a, a Christian throughout your life. You will find that there are many times that the devil tries to come and steal, kill and destroy by giving you this feeling of alienation from God, separation from God. Especially when you feel you don't make the mark. You feel that you don't have that boldness. And if we look at the story that Jesus told about the prodigal son, it's a very beautiful illustration of God's attitude as far as our human fallibility is concerned. Because the prodigal son, he wanted to squander his inheritance. And he, he, he basically said to his father, I don't care about you. Give me my inheritance and let me go. And we might think that is just a picture of salvation. But for us, a lot of times, it's a, it's a picture of the Christian life. Because our father-son relationship has fluctuations. Not from God's side, but from our side. And by studying the Gospels, looking at that radiant image of the Father in Christ you get to that point where you are always reiterated in your faith that even when you fail, even when you make mistakes, even when things go wrong in your life, you have that boldness to enter in 
and talk to your father and say to your father I love you I'm sorry you see fluctuation of fellowship is from our side and we need to have a better understanding of grace I mean the church has been very good in preaching on salvation and sin and we've been somewhat scared and reluctant to preach on grace yet if we look at the Gospels we see a picture of grace that is unequaled we see Jesus talking to a woman at the well who was involved with five men offering her living water we see Jesus looking at a woman caught in the act of adultery and not judging her but giving her grace we see Jesus looking up seeing a tax collector a scoundrel in a tree who wanted to steal people's money and was a scanniver but he heard about Jesus and he thought let me just see him he didn't say I'm repenting and this and that and he said let me just see him just that desire to see him Jesus extends that grace to him even before he shows repentance Jesus extends the grace and then this love this radiant image of the father this overwhelming love touches that man's heart where he gives away everything that he's stolen he pays back and he gives half of his wealth to the poor how did Jesus persuade him to do that it was that love that he experienced that supernatural love that reaches out to you like the Bible said while we were still sinners but somehow in Christianity we have this idea that you know we can do it and our righteousness and you know we growing and we maturing and all of that and then we fall flat on our faces when we study the Gospels in the next few sessions we need to get to that point where we see this image of God in Christ manifesting and we see the leper coming to Jesus and saying Lord if you're willing you can make me whole he says I'm willing we see he never says no to anybody we will see in the Gospels how Jesus healed people through the entire night we will see how Jesus moved even after John was beheaded and he was emotional and because John was a family member and a friend and Jesus moves to have a bit of quiet time and just to have a bit of restoration time but he sees the crowds and the Bible says he was moved with compassion we will see that one of his final acts on the cross is to say to a criminal next to him not you need to do this you need to do that you need to do that you have been a bad boy you've done this you've done that he says today you will be in paradise with me and even those who were crucifying him he said father forgive them when we really consider what we see in the gospels we sometimes find it challenging to connect that with maybe what we've heard in terms of salvation how difficult it is to be saved how difficult it is to make the grade how hard it is and yes it's a fight and all of that but Jesus is not presenting it like that he is presenting salvation as a flow of our hearts where we receive him and we follow him and when we fall we stand up and we follow again and when we walk away we turn around and we come back again this consistent process of understanding that you can't do it yourself but it's by grace this understanding that you have to depend upon his goodness and upon him and when we know that 
We will be quicker to repent, quicker to restore, and less likely to fall into cycles of condemnation. Where we sit and we are condemned to a point where we cannot receive anything in the kingdom of God. We cannot access anything because all we're feeling is not good enough. We are feeling so condemned that we cannot receive what God had given me.